that he's a bit of an up-and-comer. He likes to reflect on his games a lot afterwards, that kind of thing. Um, and he's brought a very aggressive lineup. Even Paladin is the only not aggressive deck he's brought, really. Odd Rogue, even Shaman, and Zoo Warlock, which you could almost, almost argue is an inconsistent strategy, given that he could have gone with Odd Paladin and just gone full Smork. But hey, the Even Paladin ate up a band, so it's done something right. You go Odd Paladin with a full aggressive lineup, maybe you can get the better of Hunter, but... I don't know if that's a strategy I'd like to operate under. I prefer the hybrid lineup, something more similar to what A8 has brought here, even though his uh, his Paladin actually was an Odd Paladin. Yeah. It was, yeah. I like that. Odd Paladin, even Warlock, Death Rattle Hunter, and... Token Druid. Token Druid. Seems like a solid strategy to me. Daniel could have gone for the full aggro, but he's decided to swerve a little bit with the even Paladin. No matter, that was banned anyway. So it is going to be the Odd Rogue for Daniel, though Quest Rogue has been exceedingly good so far this weekend. Odd Rogue, I don't think we've actually seen on stream up until now. Still a strong choice against a field rife with even Warlocks. True. Um, it is a big surprise to me, actually, just quite how little of Odd Rogue we've seen recently, because for the longest time, ever since Baku uh, has existed back in the Witchwood yep. days, Odd Rogue has just been considered one of the top meta decks. The best aggro deck, people have been saying. Or like, that versus uh, Odd Paladin, no, in terms of which we'll is the best survive. aggro deck. Um, but yeah, Daniel B we has found a spot here. Found a matchup where it should be able to flourish. No one drops, no hench clan thug in his opening hand, though. So uh, he's going to need to pick up those tools as soon as possible. Deadly Poison, not the one mana card that he was looking for. It should help him out at some point. Well, part of the reason that Odd Paladin, or Odd Rogue, excuse me, fell out of favor so much was, in fact, Odd Paladin. Because Odd Paladin is crazy against Odd Rogue. Yeah. And when Odd Paladin came back into the meta, Odd Rogue Sina so kind of withered away a little bit. With and then, yeah, Quest Rogue with Fan of Knives is okay against Odd Paladin. But now that even Paladin is even more popular than Odd Paladin, I would say... Odd Rogue has another good slot in the meta. Well, well, the other problem with Odd Rogue is that it's cripplingly weak to any of the Druid decks, right? Yes. Like, so, Dru I guess losing to Druid and Odd Paladin, yes, that's probably enough to uh, to push you out. You can ban one of them, but oftentimes they're included in the same lineup. However, so things get difficult then. These guys are both 5-1 and one in the Swiss, as you were saying before, uh, which is a great score. A win here gets them so close to that top 16. And hey, Soulfire isn't the worst card you could get from Blink Fox. That's four damage over the top. The way that the Warlock manages to stabilize this matchup is by getting quite low and then going for Hooked Reaver or Giant or Twilight Drake plus Sun Fury Protector, trying to put up a wall and then heal behind it with Blood Reaver, Gul'dan, or Spellstones. Soulfire is a way to get around that wall. This has just worked out beautifully for Daniel B now. Getting the Hedge Clown that he can play next turn with Soulfire if he wants to. Absolutely beautiful. Like, say Mountain Giant gets played this turn. The, the Dagger and the Soulfire will deal with the Mountain Giant. Hedge Clown will get the buff. And the Blink Fox gets to go face yet again, putting mm. A8 at 16. Unless he elects to tap and play the Giant here, which he does have the ability to do. Aha! Just out of range of that Soulfire. <laughs> that I'm sure 83650 uh, definitely is not expecting. I like the Drakes before the Giants in this matchup. The Drakes simply have a higher health total, and four attack versus eight attack early on in this matchup it's still kind of irrelevant. Yeah, right? you need to kill the Hench Clan Thug. That's going to be at four health when it comes out every time. So many Twilight Drake gets the job done. Doesn't kill Tar Creeper, though, ironically. Oh, that mouse was ever so slowly hovering towards the soul fire there. Like, am I doing it? Am I trading everything into this drake? It would have to be... You play the hench soul... plan first. Well, right? I would think that Daniel, if he's going to soul fire, would go soul fire, SI7 ah, agent, yeah. and the dagger. But there is a ch Oh! Well, yeah, with the Leroy pickup, he's going face. Okay, sure. Tarkri could protect that blink fox a little longer. It's sort of weak to Hellfire. This pushes but seven more damage. A8 goes to eight. If Leroy's not lethal by itself, and there's no dagger. But if A8 active. does Hellfire, then it will be lethal. Yeah. So. Ow. Retriever and Prey. I think the Leroy pickup off the top 
influenced that, that decision, decision yeah. greatly. Yeah, yeah. Without the Leroy, the Soulfire going to face would have been a little bit too risky because doesn't necessarily look like that Daniel could close out the game in the next couple of turns without the Leroy present. Well, now it's looking like Daniel is going to struggle to close out this game. He gets the couple of Scalbane down. Uh, whichever minion this, this buff hits, it's, it's actually pretty good. It's the Tar Creep, more health, great. The Blink Fox, it's harder to deal with, cool. Um, uh, is that enough, though? Like, I think you would much rather it hit the Tar Creeper as the Blink Fox just dies from Hellfire. And I'm, I'm not sure it's enough. Hellfire is very risky play for A3650 at any point in the next few turns. He really needs to find some of that healing. Uh, he needs to get to 10 mana so he can play Gul'dan. He needs to find a spell stone. That's a lot of things he's got to do. <laughs> yeah. It is. Well, the Scalebane is the biggest threat by itself on the board. It's also the cleanest play. I think that's probably why Daniel's leaning towards it. Hoping for the buff on the Tark Reaper here. Now the Blink Fox can get killed by a Spellstone or a Hellfire, and then that buff is not really relevant. Not that it would have been incredibly relevant anyway. But landing on the Tark Reaper and forcing the Hooked Reaver to trade in could have made a bit of a difference. I, I think if he landed on the Tark Reaper, A3650 would have just silenced it. For sure, but... It would have been a very easy uh, decision for him then. Yeah, obviously. Daniel doesn't necessarily no, know that there's a Spellbreaker present, though. Of course. Um... Shroom Brewer is a good way for, for A3650 to heal. If, if only he can find a way to fit that into a turn. Maybe there's maybe there's a Defile turn somewhere? I, no, there isn't. Well, importantly, we're ignoring the best tool that Daniel has in this matchup period, and that's File Spine Slayer. He does not right. have it just yet, but any turn going forward, as long as he holds on to the Argent Squire, he'll have an activator for it. You know, Cora, when you get to that point in a tournament where you're facing off against the Golden Celebration card back, you know you've done pretty well. You've done something right. <laughs> okay, so Defile just to soften up the Cobalt Scale Bay and allow the Drake to trade over that, and then A8, wanting to preserve the Hooked Reaver, even though this is the first turn that a one drop in a Vile Spine could come down. A8 would not be dead still because It'd be he's close. eight, the Blake Fox is only six. But it'd be very close. And, and, and A8 does not have any healing left in the deck. So after that, an SI7 agent would be enough to finish him off. Uh, very risky indeed. I agree. I, I think I would have preferred to see the healing on the face that turn. But it does look like it's paid off. I like this. It's not dead immediately on board to the Blink Fox. It forces some other source of damage to kill the Hooked Reaver if there is no Vile Spine Slayer there. And you know what? AA's at a disadvantage in this matchup. I think it's perfectly fine to okay. assume you yeah. have to get a little bit lucky. That's fair. That is fair to say that he's reached the point in the game where he says, if there's a Vile Spine Slayer, I lose. So let's just play as if there isn't, because then maybe I can manufacture a situation in which I win. Now Daniel just needs to keep this board taunt-free, because at any point, Leroy plus the dagger to face is lethal if there's no healing, or Leroy plus cold blood if there's no dagger present. But he's getting to the, the mana totals where he, he can dagger up pretty much every turn. So many The Geist will take away the cold bloods, and if there's a second deadly poison in the deck, that'll be burned as well. Looking like this may be Dread Infernal. A8 doesn't really have any other option. He can clear both minions this way, but then Leroy is just lethal. But again, does he reach that position where he has to think to himself, if my opponent has Leroy, I lose. I'm not going to play around it. Or is that one step too far? The way to play around Leroy here would be to tap and look for Sun Fury. Or second hook Reaver, I suppose. So but it's he not just... Practical. Yeah, he just doesn't feel like that's the winning line here. If there's oh, no Leroy... Playing the cold blood. Look at that. Yeah, if there's no Leroy here for Daniel, then A8's got a really substantial board, and next turn would feel much safer searching for some taunt. 
However, Daniel queued that matchup for a reason, very favorable for the Rogue. And he's going to go up to a 2-1 lead, bringing this to game number four. He'll be back on the odd Rogue. What does A8 have left remaining? Hoping now Druid. his... Okay. Which is very strong against the Odd Rogue, so it looks like it's going to come down to Zulok versus Token Druid later on. Um, assuming that this game isn't completely off the wall. Yes, and assuming this isn't just a blowout for the Rogue, which it can there's, there's chances. Yeah, you get an the, early uh, Hench Clan thug down, buff that up with Fungal Mancer, One Cobalt drop scale into bane. Dagger into Hench Clan can do things. The problem is with all druids, but especially with token druid, is cards like Spellstone, Swipe, Spreading Plague, Nourish to get to the big cards even faster. And token druid is kind of the most anti-aggro of the of the druid decks. And just taking a look at the odd rogue list from Daniel, there's no funny business, nothing like Fan of Knives in the list to prevent a turn four Whispering Woods from A8 just to try and fight on the board a little bit. So this one naturally does favor the Druid with the early removal, the ability to provide their own aggression, but also so much defensive potential with Spreading Plague and Ultimate Infestation. Yeah. We'll have to see, though, like you said, one drop plus you know, Cold Blood or yep. one drop Dagger Hench Clan Thug. It's a lot of pressure. A8 going to mulligan away that Nourish, one of the best cards in the Druid class. That's crazy. But Spellstone yeah. and Swipe are just more important in this matchup. He did get both, though. So, what's he mulliganing for if he throws this away? Is he searching for a Wild Growth, maybe? A second Spellstone? <sighs> Malfury and the Pestilence really good in this yeah, matchup. Yeah, wild Growth is simply better than Nourish. Daniel B has ended up with Myra's Unstable Element, which can also make a very big difference here, as A8 does ultimately decide to keep the Nourish, and he gets Malfury in anyway no, from the one card by. that he threw away. I think it's fine to keep the Nourish. Wild Growth is better than Nourish in the early turns, but the Nourish Not helps good. you bridge the gap to Ultimate Infestation, which might just win A8 the late game. Yep. With no one drop to play the Cold Blood on next turn, Daniel's early game's looking a little bit weaker. I don't know, Cora. He's got two Blink Foxes. That's a Whispering Woods and a Savage Roar. He's good. <laughs> sure. I mean, ideally, Daniel would have found Firefly. He would go Firefly this turn into... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Flame Elemental Cold Blood, but he still has one more turn to pick up a Dire Mole or an Argent Squire. No dice. A8 no. does find that early Whispering Woods, however. This is the thing about odd decks, though, is that Daniel doesn't mind hero powering on turn two. It's it's a good use of two mana. Next turn, he curves into Blink Fox. It's not that powerful start that he wanted, but it's it's fine. until that Whispering Woods comes out and the Soul of the Forest follows it up. Oh, boy. Yeah. Oh, look, and there's the one drop. A little bit late. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> okay. That's quite good. Well, sort of, but it loses Odd Rogue Hero Power. I have another Hero Power does three damage. It just costs, you know... That's the thing. More mana. Right now, the Hero Power does four damage. <laughs> the Vegeta. All right, Whispering Woods for Six Wisps. Daniel now has to try and mitigate this mut this board as much as he possibly can. Or just ignore it and hope that A8 doesn't have anything to back up the Wisps. We can see he has here two copies of Soul of the Forest. So he's not going to have any trouble here. Yeah, I would be very surprised if one of those Soul of the Forest wasn't played this turn. Because uh, he can play the Soul of the Forest and just trade in the Wisps. Turns them all into 2 twos while clearing away one of Daniel B's minions. This, this seems really strong to me. Doesn't need to trade in the other two Wisps. He could just go face with them. He's got a second Soul of the Forest to follow up with next turn. For even more of these death rattles. Yeah, just going to go face. Yes, A8 has to play defensively early on, but he's an aggressive deck too. And especially against a very aggressive deck like the Rogue, for the Druid to be setting the pace this early on is huge. That all being said, here we go. This is a good fungal answer. This is a good turn. 
Wow, to the point where Daniel B isn't even trading everything. He's just ignoring these trions. Okay. He's saying, I kill you before you kill me. Well, he already has seen one woods and one soul of the forest. I don't know that the I kill you before you kill me thought process is entirely accurate. I don't know if it, I don't think it happens. Especially <laughs> since there's two branching paths, two ultimate infestations, and Malfurion in the pest right, to the deck for the druid. But I also don't think trading would win Daniel the game here, so maybe this has a smaller margin for success. Daniel really isn't in the worst spot here. The fact that he's got Myra's unstable element as well. So when he does run out of sort of immediate ways to win, ways to help him out, control the board, he can just play that, try and win very quickly. Daniel shaking his head, seeing that second soul of the forest played. It's only three treants, but three treants is enough to fight for the board for another couple of turns. Well, yeah, and that nice. gets through to Malfurion. The wisp gets traded in, and that, that creates two treants. It's another four. That's, um... Oh, board's yeah. getting wide. Dagger's gonna make pretty quick work of, of these treants, though. With the Hench Clan thug just picked up, Daniel's got another threat. And he can even drop his own Malfurion next turn. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's silly, but... Uh, Effective. Both soul of the forests are gone. Yeah. Uh, th maybe this is really fringe and more of a cute play than a good play. I'm thinking when Daniel Malfurion's, he probably wants to have a fully equipped dagger because he can then deadly poison it and suddenly the hero power deals seven damage a turn. That's huge. For two turns. He do sacrifice the ability to dagger up, obviously, but if you have a dagger up the next couple of turns... Can be really strong. That's the thing. If he loses his dagger forever, that deadly poison never gets played. I don't believe you physically can play it unless you have a weapon equipped, which means uh, Myra's is Myra's strictly is worse. worse. Yeah. So yeah. Mm, fledgling's tempting, especially because you could go fledgling forager, kill the tree, re dagger, set up for Malfury and deadly poison next turn. Actually, all of these druid cards are making Myra's worse. The Forager adds an expensive card to your hand. You're going to have to wait and play later. Now, Furion is an expensive card. card. Tomb Raid. No. Tomb Lurker, no. excuse me. Uh, it's it's not... The Corpse Razor is the one that gives your minion death rattle resummon this minion. The Tomb Lurker does what, Falcone? It does something to a death rattle minion. That's correct. Ah, I had a random death rattle minion that died this game to your hand. Of course, yes. I uh, was just testing you. I did something to a death rattle minion. Here we uh, yeah, that, that card's really bad. Luckily, Daniel B didn't know what it does either, and so he had to hover over it and showed us all. Hey, I knew what Black Hole Gunspire did. I mean, so did I. I'll take that one. <laughs> I think only one person in didn't. this room didn't know what Black Hole Gunspire did. Be nice. <laughs> Tomb Worker is inconsequential, but uh, Turtle and Forager just gets you a minion that has five or more attack. So there's a lot of minions that have five or more attack. Okay, so now Deadly Poison Malfurion is, is an option. Uh, it's not ideal because he can't fit in the hero power on the same turn. He can't deal with one of these scarabs with a dagger hit. It's gonna be, it's gonna be Tomb Worker. It's just a 5-3. Pretty sure, yeah. I'm pretty sure no death battles have been played mm. this game. Let's Daniel cold blood the Tortolan Forager to clear up one of the scarabs, but the Tomb Lurker is just going to die to the hero power. And now we can see a, a things were looking maybe a little bit rougher if this turn from Daniel were really, really good. If this were like Cobalt Scalebane plus Hench Clan Thug, for instance. Another option would have been Deadly go. Poison. Cold Blood and Vaspine all this turn. It would have allowed Daniel to comfortably deal with, with both minions. And it would have made it... Whereas with, with this play, Daniel has allowed A8 to clear the board without even needing to play any cards. But if he'd fit in the Vaspine as well that turn, then A8 would have had to do something to deal with the Vaspine. So I... I'm not sure how much I agree with playing the Tomb Lurker this turn. But I guess he's thinking that Valspine will come in handy later. I'm not sure when. There aren't there aren't many big minions in this deck. He's got to get the Tomb Lurker out of the hand so Myra's can draw an additional card. And 
Now's a better time than ever, I suppose, to play this card. Force A8 to have to hero power into it. Although, you would rather he have to hero power going into turn 10, but at that point, you would just UI the term for most likely. Right. Especially since Daniel B is having a hard enough time presenting a single threat, it's really unlikely he'd be able to get another one alongside the Tomb Lurker. All right, so Teacher Oaken summons. That should summon the second Teacher. It's a strong board, but Aid has left that Tomb Lurker alive. Though I don't think it matters too much with 34 health. Well, Malfurion can scare a bit up. And then Daniel has the option to hero power, kill off a teacher. Uh, he doesn't. Mm -hmm. We've seen Daniel play this deck. He doesn't want to trade. But he can kill both teachers if he thinks oh, he has to. He has to here, I'm almost certain. Like trading in this Tomb Lurker into a 3 5, while spining the other one down. Sets up for Malfurion next turn with the mm. with the buffed up dagger already equipped. I... No, I think you just Malfurion this turn and then okay. hero power for three attack and then kill the teacher that way. Yeah, sure. No, that makes sense too. And I guess Daniel just has to hope that A8 does not have Ultimate infestation. anything good. His hand could could easily be like Savage Rock Power of the Wild. It could equally be Ultimate Infestation, Ultimate Infestation. Yeah. <laughs> Nourish right, so is, he does kill them both. Nourish is like the middle ground. It's it's kind of bad for Daniel. Not the end of the world just yet. Oh. That's an ultimate <laughs> infestation off the top, though. I couldn't even see the card. You could just tell by how quickly he grabbed it. Like, there's only one card. That you would grab that quickly. A8, if he'd played Nourish this turn, he likely would have found additional resources that he could play for the next turn, but at least he wouldn't have been able to develop anything this turn. Ultimate infestation just does it all. 39 health now for A8, 3, 6, 5, 0. And it is the odd rogue's job to dismantle that health total, get rid of the armor, and actually put that number to zero. It, it's not happening, is it? No. I'm going to go ahead and say that this is not going to happen for Daniel. It's kind of final push time now, though. He's going to play every card other than Myra's Unstable Element, and then I expect next turn we will see Myra's Unstable Element. <laughs> and... Uh, then a prompt concede straight after that. As we get the seven attack dagger finally going in. He's holding that the deck hand. I'm a little bit surprised about this because it means he'll have to play it next turn, probably just before Myra's unstable element. It also means this deck hand is never going to have charge now because he just gave up the last dagger. So I'd, I'm unsure as to why he would have wasted that opportunity to just play the one mana card. The only thing I can think of is that he was saving it for a combo in case he gets a Valspine or something next turn. It's an activator, but he's going to Myra's this turn, meaning that, that deck he's hand. going to find other one mana cards if he wants them right. as activators in the future. The deck hand is now a waste of one mana or a waste of one card space in his hand. And now he still can't kill all of these wisps, and nothing matters because there's branching pads, double power of the wild, <laughs> and Daniel B is going to be dead. In the game. Web. Yes, that is the context we're working it's, it's in. It's a very aggressive board of wisps, okay, Cora? I just wanted to check. These wisps are so angry. They're going to get your address. You imagine wisps just coming out of the screen. Or, or wispy. I try not to. I'm afraid of ghosts. Really? No. Well, I suppose it depends on the ghost. Death is eternal. My turn is not. What if it was a ghost with Lorinda's face? I'm afraid of Lorinda's face normally. Ah, so that you would be <laughs> afraid of that ghost. Just kidding. I mean, this is as much as Daniel could possibly do here. But Savage Roar, <laughs> Pads. Or Power of the Wild, take your pick. <laughs> Any combination. Choose your path. Of the aforementioned. Is going to be lethal here for A8. So, so he's going to bring this one over to game five. It is going to come down to the Zoo Warlock versus A8's Token Druid. Which is actually a close matchup. It is. I still like the Token Druid, though. 
I kind of like the Warlock in that matchup. I, I kind of like the Warlock. Warlock has, Zoo in particular, the ability to go quite tall instead of wide against Druid, which it needs to. It needs to play around Spreading Plague as much as it can. True. But True. cards like Fungal Mancer and Soul Infusion and Keleseth really allow the deck to do that quite easily. That's true. And a traditional, say, Malagos Druid would have more means of clearing the board from the zoo with, you know, Malagos plus Swipe. What I will say, and I think this is relevant, is that there's no Despicable Dreadlord in the Warlock deck. That is very relevant. And that would help with this matchup. Frankly, though, I mean, I already like the Druid in this matchup. I also like the side that has World Championship competitor A3650. That's fair. On it. And to be perfectly honest, you're not playing around the win condition of the Druid in any way. You're playing against Spreading Plague. Yeah. And when the Plague comes down, how effective it is, you know, does the Druid have the ability to buff it straight away? And in that regard, the Token Druid, I think, does have a little bit of an advantage because they're running two Power of the Wilds, whereas other Druids are not. So this is going to come down to, honestly, how good is the start for Daniel? Does he find Kaliseth? Does he have Flame Imps? Does he get a Fungal Mancer on Curve? Or is he forced to go wide with more of those healing cards, like Voodoo Doctor or Light Warden? Some smaller stuff that maybe isn't as threatening as it needs to be and is instead just spreading Plague Fodder. A lot of, the, a lot of this matchup is skill testing for the Druid as well. It's knowing when to use these removal cards like the Spellstone, when to save the Spellstone, when to use the Swipe, when to save it. We just saw A8 mulligan away, Malfurion and Swipe, but he got rewarded by the Spellstone. He wants Wild Growths, nourishes now. He needs to get up to the mana so he can cast Scenarius, Ultimate Infestation just drawn off the top there. Malfurion is a little bit too slow in this matchup. You're happy to have it on turn seven, but you can't keep it in your mulligan. Yeah. And the swipe as well, because of all of the buffs that I mentioned, mm -hmm. is not going to be as good as you would think. No. This isn't an odd paladin you're playing against. But the hand for Daniel B is not awesome. Uh, with the Fungal Enchanter, if you were to find Happy Ghoul or Light Warden, he could maybe get a nice board out in the next couple turns. But at this point, Cobalt Librarian is not the one drop you want. You want Flame Imp all day, every day. Yep, not an ideal start for Daniel B. Compared to what he could come up with, makes A8's turn very easy. Just hero power thing down. Picking up the second Spellstone is great as well. Again, he needs... He needs a wild growth. He needs these other early game tools. He'd like an Oaken Summons. Start getting Violet Teachers out, Whispering Woods, that kind of thing. But in the meantime, A8 is okay. Now, this is rough from the zoo perspective. Doubling Imp into Doubling Imp is the best that Daniel B has right now, but this is just really bad in the face of Spreading Plague. Fortunately for him, A8 hasn't had any ramps, so Plague's still going to be a couple turns away. But still, yeah. Daniel needs to keep his board as small yet strong as possible. The Solarium is not the card he wanted in his opening hand either. Like he wants he wants cards like, yeah, Light Warden, great. Now where's the Voodoo Doctor Happy Ghoul Happy Ghoul to follow that up with? That's that's the start my opponents always get when I'm against a zoo deck. Flame it, coin, Voodoo Doctor, Happy Ghoul. Happy Ghoul. Happy Ghoul, Happy Ghoul, yeah. Don't forget the second Happy Ghoul, that's important. It's always there. That's the hand. So many possibilities. Oh, he's a Volcano Gamer. <laughs> oh, we like him. Sometimes you just need a little bit of lava to help you think. Clear out the brain. Something I really enjoy about Dreamhacks, as opposed to other events, is that we actually watch directly from one of the players' perspectives, and that means we see his mouse movements and everything. When they're fidgeting with the board and, and clicking on things, we can see them do that, and it's, it's just another way of getting sort of inside the player's head. Something you miss out on when you spectate through spectator mode because you don't get to see those clicks. Some of the players have a lot going on in their head and that manifests as a lot of clicks on the board. I click on the board constantly when I'm playing. Are you a nervous clicker? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Daniel played that librarian this turn instead of the doubling imp because he wanted this light warden on the board. Plain and simple. Fungal Enchanter can come down next turn. Light warden gets buffed. That's the biggest threat he has available to him right now. 
and A8 has a really uncomfortable turn four. If he'd kept that swipe, he would have been able to clean up a little bit of this board. But, I mean, other options, just double spell stone on two pretty underwhelming minions. At the very least, this Light Warden's got to go. It does. I think he holds on to the other one. He's taking four damage from these two doubling in. It's, like the, it, it's, it's he, fine. He's got time. What he, he doesn't have is a Nourish. What he really needs is a Nourish. <laughs> nourish would, I think, just about close this out. If he finds mm -hmm. Nourish off the top, for mana, you put down two Arcane Tyrants, Malfurion on the following turn, and then you go so cleanly into the ultimate infestation. But that's really all that his hand is missing to come together. A8 wishes he could clear this board. He wants to play around Fungal Mansa really badly. Wild Growth is... That's something. It allows him to play Malfurion next turn. Not quite as good as Nourish would have been, but it's it's something. You can just see how much additional damage a Flame Imp could have connected this game or could have allowed um, you know, that Fungal Enchanter to connect because the Spellstone likely would have been used very early on. Here he's going to land a pretty nice Fungal Mancer, but the follow-up isn't... Doomguard, for instance. It's, it's not second Fungal Mancer, it's a bunch of small stuff again. This is sort of the start of the stabilization, though. This is the... This is the okay, what taunts up? What about a hero power? You can't get through this at the moment, although with that Doomguard pickup, Daniel B can start to deal some serious damage going to be able to push through both of these scarabs this turn comfortably and then push forward to the phase plus soul fire if he wants to if he can well if it doesn't get discarded sure this is the uncomfortable part of playing a new warlock and he actually discarded both of the cards that he couldn't play after the doom guard anyway yeah, that's fine holding on to very importantly that solarium that's going to be some really valuable reload. Yeah. I was wondering if he'd consider soul firing this turn as well, but I think, as you say, the Solarium's just in Oh, boy. That's that's what you want off the top of your deck. That's the card. That goes into the Scenarius, into the ultimate infestation. Oh, my goodness. Double Arcane Tyrant comes down as well. Wow. And this is the turn, isn't it? Like I was saying to Derek yesterday, that's a great spreading plague. Not because the spreading plague's particularly good, but because Double Arcane Tyrant backing it up is just so much pressure on the back end. Solarium needs to find second Doom Guard or second Fungal Mancer or Mossy Horror if Daniel's running it. Finds the Doom Guard. And plays the Doom Guard. Who dares me? Okay. If he's going to jam a one drop, he should have played the Flame Imp first. So he'd much rather have the Flame Imp than the Void Walker, I think. Well, is he playing around? I and he, and he's not I, lethal sensor? Maybe. I suppose forcing the three damage to go through the Void Walker is fine. But then if he knew he wanted to play the Void Walker, he should have just played the Void Walker. Right. I think that was just more so he didn't really care what one drop he played. Scenarius has to be the play here, right? Like buff the Scarab trade to the Void Walker. Both Could arcane... even just put two twos down. No. Yeah, buff the Tyrant's buff, trade yeah. over the Doom Guards. Exactly, exactly. Mm. Oh, and then oh, only, the, so good. only the imp goes face next turn. That's four damage. But as we can see, another four from the soul fire. Daniel will be only three damage off lethal. No, he's got to get through. The oh, scarab. sorry. Yeah, totally missed the fact the scarab. There's, there's a there. three six in the way, no, saying that's, that's you're big. not getting through right now. So put the soul fire where you want it, and then he's not playing dreadlord. You said. No, he's not. Oh, that's that's just. And this is if why the zoo's this far behind at this point, the zoo is not winning this game. This is why I said I think the stop, the um, the dreadlord can make all the difference. It, it's the card that deals with whis whispering woods easily, and it's the card that deals with boards like this. The real issue this game was the weaker start from Daniel B. And of course, then you have to point to the spreading plague off the top from AA three six five zero. He didn't have much wrap this game, but even still, a perfectly timed spreading plague with two arcane tyrants to back it up is going to spell victory in AA3650, going to take game number five, putting himself to a six and one record. Remember, guys, AA3650 has qualified for the world championship from the summer championship. So not a surprise to see him doing well in this event whatsoever. That's why I said before, I